Um, so yeah, just please feel free to jump in with questions if you have them. Um, I uh, definitely, I guess this is my first, with this project is my first time using SAX and I, I definitely don't have the background that some of you have in it. Um, so the, um, I guess way to start off would be to say that when I ended up deciding to use SAX, what I was interested in was looking at two very specific proteins. So um, I'm a postdoc here at UNC Chapel Hill in the NEAR lab, and we're very interested in studying LPL, so it's lipoprotein lipase. So this, that's a secreted enzyme that basically goes into your capillaries and it hydrolyzes the triglycerides that are found in um, basically the, the lipoproteins there. So chylomicrons, VLDL, um, it takes those triglycerides and it hydrolyzes them to release free fatty acids. And you can then use those free fatty acids for storage in the adipose tissue, or you can use them for energy in the oxidative tissue. Um, and obviously if you have a, a patient that has an LPL deficiency, that's really detrimental and it can lead to severe hypertriglyceridemia, which in turn can lead to uh, recurrent pancreatitis. And of course, uh, as many of you I'm sure have heard, uh, the, the high triglycerides also can be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So that's the reason our lab is really interested in lipoprotein lipase. Um, so the thing that I think is, well, very unique and interesting about it is it's actually regulated by two uh, protein inhibitors. So these are macromolecular inhibitors that are actually secreted and, um, sorry, regulated um, and then secreted in a nutritionally dependent manner. So to kind of boil it down to the basics, um, you have uh, one protein that's made after, you're eat, after you've eaten, or at least that becomes active after you've eaten. And this is called angiopoietin-like protein three or ANG3. Um, and what happens is, is that it's made in the liver and it's secreted into the capillaries and it actually inhibits LPL specifically at the oxidative tissues. So as you can imagine, this leaves LPL active at your adipose tissue, meaning that you're storing the free fatty acids uh, for energy later when you've just eaten. And there's a lot of glucose available to be used as fast and easy energy. Um, and four is basically the opposite side of that coin. So when you're fasting and you have, you know, deficiency of glucose available, uh, the uh, ANG4 uh, expression is turned on in the adipose tissue. And so it inhibits LPL at the adipose. And that in turn shuttles the free fatty acids uh, to the oxidative tissue because the LPL remains active there. Um, and so one of the reasons we're also interested in these proteins is as you can imagine, uh, you know, LPLs, if, if we didn't have these inhibitors would always be active. And so that would allow us to basically figure out a way to keep the uh, free fatty acids flowing out of your uh, blood and into storage or energy um, usage. So that would be beneficial for cardiovascular health. And so um, I guess I'll start by saying that when I came into this project there, so there's not been a structure of um, either of these proteins. Um, they're um, predicted coiled coil um, proteins, specifically on the N terminal. They both have an N terminal domain that inhibits LPL and a C terminal domain that forms a fibrinogen like structure. Uh, and the fibrinogen like structure was actually solved by crystallography, but we know that that isn't um, the portion that actually you know, inhibits the LPL. So I was really interested in trying to get this N terminal structure. Um, and so the first sign I had that things were going to be a little different than I expected was when I put them over um, sec moles. Um, and so as you can kind of see, I've indicated down here, ANG3 is a, the end terminal is about 25 kilodaltons and ANG4 is about 15 kilodaltons. Um, and when they came off of the sec moles, it said they're both coming off as what appears to be trimers. Um, the reason I said this kind of gave me a signal something maybe was up was that they actually both alluded much sooner than I would have expected given their size. Um, and so that suggested to me that, um, you know, I was potentially dealing with something very elongated. So I took a couple of cracks at um, putting it onto negative stain grids um, and looking at it in other ways. And what I did see was basically what appeared to be like kind of long string-like structures, um, which makes some degree of sense given the coil, coil uh, setup. And so, that's when I decided to turn to um, SACS, um, given that you know, it seemed that the protein could potentially be flexible. 
And so we were able to do um, size exclusion sacks. Uh, we did actually try to do regular sacks, uh, high throughput sacks first, but we did find that um, there was, you know, a mix or it was enough of a mixture or, or enough aggregates that it just wasn't um, going to be a usable um, reading that we got with the high throughput sacks. Um, so looking at this data, we are basically able to confirm the oligomeric state is a trimer, that it is uh, definitely elongated. And, you know, we can see signs um, in the cracky plot that it's going to be potentially a flexible um, protein. Um, and so for ANG4, we actually, uh, so this work done with ANG4 actually predates um, my time in the lab. It was done actually at um, Argonne National Lab using their um, BioCat beam lines that also has a size exclusion sacs uh, set up. And um, what you can see is, is it's a very similar uh, elongated um, flexible protein. And so this sort of gave us the kind of the first hints that these proteins actually share a lot of similarities. It had been thought in our field that these proteins are quite different and that they have very different inhibition abilities. Um, but you know, when we were looking at them structurally, on the you know the, on sort of like a high level look at them with SACs, they seem fairly similar. You know, coiled, coiled, elongated, flexible trimers. So that you know gave us our starting point, and from then we um, kicked off and we started doing a bunch of kinetics and. Um, uh, we go on to compare those in our paper. So if anyone actually would like to know more, we have plenty of connects to look at. <laughs> um, and with that, I'd just like to thank the lab. Um, Aspen was the graduate student who did the work um, with Argon. And um, we had some collaborators here at UNC as well. And then of course, I have to thank Sybils and of course BioCat as well um, for you know, letting us try different things with our protein until we were able to actually get some usable data. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions.